I don't know what it takes for people to begrudge earning a living so that they can begin living in earnest. To become aware that the opposite of being at work is not being off work, but making things work out. And themselves working out in the world as if in a gym we jointly own and help design. And of making the world work because we give it the special attention we reserve for our private affairs. The foundation of capitalism rests on thievery. The theft by the owner of the worker's surplus labor, that is, the labor beyond subsistence that makes possible the owner's profit. And the laws made to protect the thieves from each other, no one obeys more scrupulously than the thieves. Unless they can steal with impunity, then no one steals with more abandon than the thieves. Until we value our own time, the only time we have, heaven, that South Sea bubble notwithstanding, will give it away like a slut after church. As human beings, we're individuals. But as members of society, we're social creatures. As Marx reiterates in the Grundrisse, quote, society does not consist of individuals. It expresses the sum of connections and relationships in which individuals find themselves. It is as though one were to say, from the standpoint of society, there are neither slaves nor citizens. Both are men. Rather, they are so, that is, human, outside society. To be a slave or to be a citizen are social determinations, the relationships of man A and man B. Man A is not a slave as such. He is a slave within society and because of it. Status quo, the level at which everything flows, the current state of affairs, the phrase also refers to those who have an interest in preventing the current state of affairs from disappearing down a sinkhole. Hence, much of the work of the status quo is to ensure the stability of the status below, upon which it stands, upon which it takes its stand. For a status on the go like the status quo requires a status submerged below if the former is to keep its head above water. Quote, These concrete social relations are not those between one individual and another, continues Marx, but between worker and capitalist, tenant and landlord, etc., Eliminate these relations, and you abolish the whole of society. Your Prometheus will then be nothing more than a specter without arms or legs." Unquote. <clears throat> this is why whether one individual loves or hates another has nothing to do with altering the structure of society, and also why the more the popular culture resonates with the ethos of love, which is a matter between individuals and not between classes of individuals, the more inclined it is to nestle down snugly into the rat hole reserved for it by the rat keepers. In a revolution in revulsion against capitalism, I recommend decapitation as the punishment de rigueur. Decapitate capital. Put the heads of state in the hands of all. The head exploits the hands, acts as if it isn't attached to the same body, but the hands hold their own against the head because they outnumber it. Critics later argued that decapitation expressed the influence of samurai films on the revolution. Heads of state, leading heads, heads of class, heads of beer, whatever rises to the top and detaching itself from the body forms a head, the revolt blows away. The severed head rolls across the floor and stops with its ear to the wall. 
Capital kaput, the headline reads. Bring down a capital chap, the editor recommends. Boss loss is heavy this week. The health can't help it. The head of the house, the head of the bank, the department head, off with their heads. The latest in suicide is auto decapitation. How do you want it, cap or decap? But it takes the right hardware to do it unbotched. I mean, you don't want to have to clean up the apartment with your head in a sling. Decapitate head waiters. I want the head of Texas right next to the head of Exico. Yes, just before decap, the head of Exico sold the M for mucho dinero. Decapitate every chief from engineer to engine. Wanted. Experience go-getter to head up Department of Decapitation. People who are born into a world where, who could have guessed, it's a sign of incompetence not to be a thief and believe what they are told, namely that stealing is bad, that thieves are punished, etc., lead the lives of the insane to the extent that they deny their suspicion of the truth lead the lives of the desperate to the extent that, acting on their suspicion, they buck the hierarchy of thieves in the name of personal independence, but not the principle of thievery in the name of justice, and rob the thieves and either escape detection or are punished for it. But they alone lead fruitful lives who commune with each other and collect and plan and execute the plan to change the world in favor of the victim of crime instead of the criminal. Everybody knows that it's no crime to rob the robber. Question. Should a worker murder his or her boss if the worker can escape detection? Answer. Since only individuals who possess class consciousness can dissolve a system, cancel an oppressive concept at one, stro at one stroke, reprogram all the computers, not just one computer at a time, let's rephrase the question. By murdering a boss, does a worker bring capitalism one step closer to capitulation? I don't see how to answer this question either. Let's try again. Since capitalism is an arrangement for deriving profit, if I prevent my boss from profiting, don't I, as it were, murder him? There is nothing wrong with profit. It's with the inequitable redistribution of profit that the fault lies. So let's try again. But first an excursion before I forget it. If I kill a cop, I'm a cop killer. If I killed every cop, I would be a cop. Is it when I secure the monopoly on cop killing that I become a cop? And so long as I freelance, I remain a cop killer? Now I'm really confused. Good. I might be getting somewhere. Let's return to the original topic. Capitalism represents a class of owners who combine into an abstract person, call him golden boy, who unfairly distributes the wealth produced by all. Likewise, the people comprise a class of workers who combine into an abstract person, we have called it Menschlichkeit, for the purpose of going into business for itself. Okay, now the question seems to boil down to, if a worker murders a boss, and the worker is one member of the class Menschlichkeit, and the boss one member of the class Golden Boy, has the class Menschlichkeit diminished the class Golden Boy by one unit? It has, if and, if and only if, the murdered boss cannot be replaced by a substitute. Wait, wait a minute. Isn't the real question, would you kill a thief if you had the, an opportunity to kill one without incurring the retribution of the thief of police? By all means. The difference between nature and man, a breeze and a fan, an icicle and a popsicle, war and revolution. The capitalist process, writes Joseph A. Schumpeter, 
rationalizes behavior and ideas, and by so doing, chases from our minds, along with metaphysical belief, mystic and romantic ideas of all sorts. Schumpeter adds, the bourgeois finds to his amazement that the rationalist attitude does not stop at the credentials of kings and popes, but goes on to attack private property and the whole scheme of bourgeois values. Unquote. Quote, Three successive usages with respect to captives, summarizes Lewis Morgan, appeared in the three sub-periods of barbarism. In the first, he was burned at the stake. In the second, he was sacrificed to the gods. And in the third, he was made a slave. All alike, they proceeded upon the principle that the life of the prisoner was forfeited to his captor. This principle became so deeply seated in the human mind that civilization and Christianity combined were required for its displacement." Unquote. Unfortunately, people are still convinced that since they are held captive by capitalism, that their work lives are forfeited to their employers. Revolution must be added to civilization and religion as the requirement for displacing once and for all the principle that the life of the prisoner, in this case the wage worker, is forfeited to his captor. The sheep, the shepherd, the wolf. The wolf creates the need for the shepherd. Hence, the shepherd is the counter-wolf. Thus, the counter-wolf leads the sheep. But the counter-wolf outranks and therefore dominates the sheep. Hence, the counter-wolf provokes the sheep into becoming counter-shepherd. With the shepherd, then, the sheep share the characteristic of being counter-wolf. With the wolf, they share the characteristic of being counter-shepherd. If the sheep are ever to lead themselves, they must counter the counter-wolf. They must counter the counter-shepherd. Now, if the sheep counter the counter-wolf, that is, if they oppose the shepherd, they affirm the wolf, that is, they share with the wolf its shepherd-hating quality. They become wolf-sheep. Likewise, if they counter the counter-shepherd, that is, if they oppose the wolf, they affirm the shepherd, that is, they share with the shepherd his or her wolf-hating quality. They become shepherd-sheep. Hence, sheep must become wolf and shepherd in one fleecy package. Wolves and woolens must sheep be, for sheep to be themselves and free. If mankind survives, it will be out of enlightened defiance of established nihilism. With pleasure I anticipate the transition of people from diffidence to defiance. The words diffidence and defiance are related both from the Latin defido, which means to distrust. Diffidence, that is, modesty or shyness, is the result of distrusting or lacking confidence in myself because the confidence placed in another with whom I identify has been betrayed. Hence, by failing to separate, as the psychologists say, from the betrayer, that is, by failing to distinguish myself as a separate person with my own fate or destiny, for example, I vaguely feel that if I betray the other, I somehow betray myself, until, that is, the matter is brought to consciousness, which is especially difficult so long as the other vigorously combats bringing the matter to consciousness. Agreed. But when's the confidence to attain confidence? Well, for me, it's like this. The very idea of the corporate takeover of society by its vast majority of stockholders exhilarates me, fills me with hope, the opposite emotion to bourgeois despair, that at this very moment, hope is hardening into the stone of the fruit of defiance. 
quote, as Vico says, human history differs from natural history in this, that we have made the former, but not the latter. Karl Marx. The function of the terrorist is to express the repressed pain of the people. To the extent that the terrorist lacks awareness of his or her function, as the, in the case of fundamentalist terrorists, the terrorist expresses the unconscious of the people. The word proletariat ultimately derives from the Latin pro olesco, which means still growing. Olesco is cognate with alesco, alimentary, alimony, which means requiring sustenance, needing nourishment. In other words, the proletariat is a socioeconomic class whose dynamic structure is analogous to that of a living organism, to a growing girl or boy. Hence, pro olesco, advancing in growth. Ad olesco, growth toward maturity, as in adolescent. Olesco is also cognate with old, that is, ripened as the result of a metabolic process. The Latin noun proles means offspring, progeny, child. And the noun proletarius, according to a division of the Roman people by Servius Tullius, is a citizen of the lowest class who serves the state not with his property, but only with his children, that is, by providing soldiers to fill the ranks of the legions. Marx reapplies Tullius's meaning of proletarius. The proletariat provides workers to fill the ranks of the workforce. But Marx also generalizes the meaning of proletariat. He assigns to it the task of eliminating the division between the class of owners and the class of workers, toward the end of making equal ownership of the global economy the natural birthright of every human being. But so long as the proletariat fails to recognize itself as the embodiment of the human species, that is, as the class without class, we remain stuck in prehistory. For our true history hasn't even begun, with the self-invalidating fantasy that the world endows us with power instead of we endowing it. Quote, as the decisive battle in the class struggle approaches, writes George Luchaks in 1923, the power of a true or false theory to accelerate or retard progress grows in proportion. The realm of freedom, the end of the prehistory of mankind, means precisely that the power of the objectified, reified relations between men begins to revert to man. The closer the process comes to its goal, the more urgent it becomes for the proletariat to understand its own historical mission, and the more vigorously and directly and directly, proletarian class consciousness will determine each of its actions. For the blind power of the forces at work, that is, the disintegration of capitalist society, will only advance automatically to their goal of self-annihilation so long as that goal is not within reach. When the moment of transition to the realm of freedom arrives, this will become apparent because the blind force of capitalism will hurtle blindly toward the abyss, that is, toward universal destruction. And only the conscious will of the proletariat will be able to save mankind from the impending catastrophe. In other words, when the final economic crisis of capitalism develops, the fate of the revolution, and with it the fate of mankind, will depend upon the ideological maturity of the proletariat, that is, on its class consciousness. And you thought that revolution was just a matter of getting a raise. 
But as the proletariat has been entrusted by history with the task of transforming society consciously, Luchax continues, its class consciousness must develop a dialectical contradiction between its immediate interests and its long-term long -term objectives, and between the discrete factors and the whole. For the discrete factor, the concrete situation with its concrete demands is, by its very nature, an integral part of the existing capitalist society. It is governed by the laws of that society and is subject to its economic structure. Only when the immediate interests are integrated into a total view and related to the final goal of the process, that is, only when a radical egalitarian world beckons with compelling vividness, do the immediate interests become revolutionary, pointing concretely and consciously beyond the confines of capitalist society. Quote, the class consciousness of the proletariat is the sense become conscious of the historical role of the class. This sense will objectify in particular interests of the moment, which may only be omitted at the price of allowing the proletarian class struggle to slip back into the most primitive utopianism. Every momentary interest may have either two functions, either it will be a step <clears throat> toward the ultimate goal, or else it will conceal it. Which of the two it will be depends entirely upon the class consciousness of the proletariat, and not on victory or defeat in isolated skirmishes. Quote, in the case of the other classes, we found an antagonism between the class's self-interest and that of society, between individual deed and social consequences. Here, in the center of proletarian class consciousness, we discover an antagonism between momentary interest and ultimate goal. The outward victory of the proletariat can only be achieved if this antagonism is inwardly overcome. Unquote. George Luchak's History and Class Consciousness, published in 1923. Marx defined the proletariat sub specie capitalis, that is, from the standpoint of the capitalist class which created it. It was not his responsibility, nor, except inferentially from his exhaustive analysis of the bourgeois system of production, was it his intention to define the proletariat for itself, that is, to define its ultimate goals. How the proletariat defines itself for itself, how, in other words, it evolves from a blind natural force, the L.A. riots in 1992, for instance, to a purposive, human, even more terrible force that knows where it's going, even though it has never been there, is its own business, its own class responsibility, that is, the responsibility of each of us acting together to choose the route necessary to arrive at our destination. Having thrown up our hands in despair, let's join them and advance to the front. For when no one can help him or herself, no one can help helping each other. Quote, for the active and practical side of class consciousness, its true essence can only become visible in its authentic form when the historical process imperiously requires it to come into force, that is, when an acute crisis in the economy drives it to action. At other times, it remains theoretical and latent, corresponding to the latent and permanent crisis of capitalism. <coughs> It confronts the individual questions and conflicts of the day with its demands as mere consciousness, as an ideal sum, in Rosa Luxemburg's phrase, unquote, George Luchak's. 
That's why in the recession that began in 2008, when President Obama didn't nationalize the banks, uh, we the final object of a proletariat class was contradicted, and it just became a conflict of the day to dis, uh, to decide how otherwise the uh, uh, problems created by the recession should be resolved. Quote, the form taken by the class consciousness, Luchak's informs us, is the party. Unquote. But nowadays, as I say, the block party rather than the political one. Because after the betrayal of the revolution by the Russian Communist Party, the idea of a political party serving as the vehicle of revolution is still too abhorrent for us to willingly entertain. My hope is that global issues like ecology will pressure people into forming an association composed of an entire global generation that transcends national boundaries. From inequality to equality to quality. From quality as the difference between unequals to quality as the difference between equals. That's the difference. <laughs>